Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is about secondary education for migrant students in Germany and Sweden. Now this is the third in a series about the inclusion of migrants and refugee students in German and Swedish educational systems in the wake of the migrant crisis. If you want to watch them in order, I'll link the first one in the description box. It gives a little background on why I chose these two countries as well as talking about the structure of the preschool system and migrant inclusion in that. The second video focuses on primary education and that leads me to this video. Secondary education begins either with fifth or seventh grade in Germany, depending on the state. There are three different tracks in most states, the Hauptschule, the Realschule, and the Gymnasium. Germany is an early tracking country, meaning that students are segregated according to the type of secondary education they are pursuing, either vocational or university-bound academic, relatively early in the school years. There are different entrance requirements for each level of schooling, and each level is housed in a separate building, so this physically and socially segregates students. The Hauptschule is the least rigorous of the levels and accepts all students regardless of grades, test scores, or teacher recommendations. As with other systems of tracking, the least prestigious track is often played with a concentration of low achievers and behavior issues which pull down the collective achievement. But this was so much of an issue in some parts of Germany that the Hauptschule has been eliminated in favor of an expanded Realschule or an open enrollment procedure. Regardless, the Hauptschule and the Realschule are both vocational options which combine school based and company based training and this is important to understand because migrants are overrepresented in these vocational tracks. It might be that migrants do not perform as well on the fourth grade assessments or they do not get as many teacher recommendations. Um, this is an issue for children who are recently arrived and who do not speak German proficiently because they are more or less locked into a career path as young as nine years old. Now, there is some flexibility in several federal states to allow students to take entrance exams for a higher level of schooling as they complete one level, meaning that they can complete the Realschule and then take an entrance exam for the gymnasium. There's also some flexibility of the pathways within a level of schooling. A student may start out learning to be a baker and then transition after a year or two to cosmetology. Like changing majors at a university, this can delay graduation, but better to finish a program that you will enjoy than one you hate, especially if it's leading you directly to a trade or career. In all, students who complete five, six, or nine years of secondary schooling receive some sort of school leaving qualification, what we would call a diploma in the US, but I'm not using that term because the different tracks have different qualifications. Then, depending on their program, they may move directly into the workforce, onto a technical school, or onto university. There are literally hundreds of different paths that students take to meet their secondary qualifications in Germany, as opposed to the dichotomy of high school or GED that exists in the US. So what can we learn from this system? The real benefit of the early German tracking is that students who complete the program are integrated into the workforce at a relatively young age and are able to earn a living. But migrant students leave school after lower secondary and without a qualification of any sort at more than twice the rate of their non-migrant peers. An astonishing 40% of migrant students in 2011 left school before receiving a full qualification. One of the studies that addresses this sad reality notes that in order to finish a vocational program, students must receive an apprenticeship placement in a company and complete a training program on site. And migrant students are significantly less likely to be placed. It appears that companies are discriminating against students with migrant backgrounds. Obviously, this is not an outcome that any migrant educator would be satisfied with. But I'm going to turn this question to you now. How might we take the idea of multiple routes to a secondary qualification and apply it in the US? And how can we reduce the chance that students will drop out of the program before they finish? Moving north, let's look at the Swedish system of secondary education. It is very different from Germany's, starting with the age of students choose their path. In contrast to Germany's fourth grade tracking, compulsory education in Sweden extends through ninth grade and is housed in the same school buildings as primary grades. There are no tracks. Everything is generally the same from student to student and school to school following the national curriculum. After completing the compulsory years, students have a few options. There are 12 vocational tracks they can pursue and six subject specific college prep tracks. All of these are between two and three and a half years and they are all housed in the same upper secondary building. So if there is not the physical and social segregation as in Germany between the different tracks. Significantly few migrants than non-migrants complete upper secondary school of any kind. 
Now, as for including migrants in the secondary schooling system, there are some good things and some not so good things. Like in the preschool and primary grades, mother tongue instruction is statutorily available to migrants. To learn more about that, make sure you watch the first and second video in the series. I go into much more detail there. Another helpful modification for migrants is the ability to replace Swedish literature with Swedish as a second language for the same credits toward a diploma. Still, migrants who arrive when they're older teens and do not speak Swedish at all, and this is the majority of recent arrivals, since Swedish is not a frequently taught foreign language in most parts of the world, unlike English or French. Those late arrivals often are placed in a Segregated Language Introduction Program, or LIP, to try to get them up to speak quickly and able to attend regular classes, albeit with some language support. This can create a problem of students aging out of the regular education system before they gain enough Swedish to complete a secondary program. There is new legislation which limits time in the LIP to two years, but this is still not really helpful for students who arrive at 17 or 18 years old. Those students are destined to complete their education in basic adult education programs, if at all. The so-called late arrival penalty is also an issue in the United States. It's very difficult for students who arrive when they are between the ages of 15 and 18 to complete high school on time. Schools are torn between giving students time to really get up to speed with their English and pushing the student through credit-bearing classes so they will graduate, quote, on time or within four years. On-time graduation rate is a measure of school quality and one of the indicators that federal and state governments use to assess how well a school is doing. Unfortunately, it does not take into account that language acquisition, and particularly academic language, takes years and years. So here's again where I turn the question over to you. How can we give intensive English support to our older newcomers while still having them graduate on time? Is that even possible? What is your school or district doing? I know that there are innovative models out there, so please Please share your experiences in the comments, and as always, like and subscribe for regular content about migrants and refugees in education in the news. I'm Katherine McDougall. Stay tuned for the next episode. Ciao.